going to recap this morning's message and maybe go just a little bit farther on being filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, this morning's message, I believe the title we put on that was Baptized into Baptized in Liquid Fire. Now, the way the Lord began showing me the baptism in the Holy Spirit was a little bit different. And uh, recapping again from this morning, he showed me first a candle. Uh, Proverbs says, the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. But at the fall of Adam, man's candle went out. Jesus spoke about lighting the candle. See, when you get born again, your spirit goes from darkness to light. A good analogy would be, he lit your candle. Well, that's the new birth. And that's really the light that we're to walk by. All of the messages, I call them Nathan 101, <laughs> to, to walk by your new nature, to walk by the, that inward voice, the conscience, uh, where your thoughts accuse or approve of different actions, and you follow, that's walking in the light as he is in the light. And that candle, is tip, that typifies that. And Jesus says you don't light a candle and hide it under a bushel. You light the candle, lift it up so everyone can see. Okay. So we could teach a message right there about there's supposed to be a difference in how we walk than the world walks. They're supposed to see a difference, okay? But that candle is not really the power of God. It's the power for you to walk above sin. But Jesus himself, he had that light in him from his first birth. That's the, that's the very life he was conceived with. It's the light that we receive at our second birth. Amen? Jesus, and Jesus spoke of that. Right there, John chapter 8, where they brought the woman in adultery. Now, I know it was a trap. It was a setup because they caught him right in the act. Okay. I noticed they didn't bring the man. <laughs> anyway. And they expected Jesus to side with the law and, and to stone her. And Jesus stooped down and he wrote on the ground whatever he wrote. Wouldn't you like to know <laughs> exactly? But whatever he wrote, when they read what he wrote, they left one at a time till there was no accusers left. And he said to the woman, where are your accusers? He said, there's none, Lord. And he said the most amazing thing. He said, well, neither do I accuse thee. But he did say, go and sin no more. Now, she was walking in adultery. Would you call that walking in darkness? Yes. Well, absolutely. But he says in the very next few statements, and I... In my meditations, I like to think when he says, uh, go and sin no more, I don't think she left the building. She might have. But in my meditation, I'm, I'm thinking she's going, uh, I'm going to listen to you for a while. I think she found a place and stayed and listened. And to me, it helps my meditator to think she was there when he said almost just a few sentences later, he says, those that follow me shall not walk in darkness but they shall have the light of life. Whew. And that same chapter is where, is the same where, we, uh, where he says, whom the Son makes free is free indeed. And he's talking about sin. See, that candle is what God empowered us with. That is to walk in the light as he is in the light. It's how he walked sin free. He gave us that same life so that we can walk sin free. Now, your flesh does not like that light. Let's, let's talk about that before we get to baptism in the Holy Ghost. My flesh wants, it's to this day, my flesh wants what it wants when it wants it. It has no moral compass at all. I've been saved and filled with the Holy Ghost a long time. And my flesh, if I let it, it will do anything I let it do. It has no moral compass. It feels no guilt, my flesh, at all. It thinks adultery is a fine thing. It thinks getting high. Why don't we do that? Yeah, we should do that. See, that's the way the flesh is. It, f it will fight your spirit every step of the way. Remember, Galatians 5 is not written to unsaved people. Galatians 5 is written to Christians. And it's saying, if you're going to walk in the spirit, you cannot walk in agreement with your flesh. These two are contrary the one to the other and it's ex out now I every time I read that I can't help but think you can't put a new patch on an old garment these two agree not they are 
contrary the one to the other. And there, there comes fasting. What we, the tool that we have in this dispensation till we get a new wineskin, fasting somehow keeps that old wineskin from bursting. For keeps it down, lowers it. Okay, that's not really the message tonight. But I'm finding your flesh, it'll fight even against a candle. But see, we're not told to go with now. That candle is a witness in and of itself. The world should see a different walk in the Christian than they do in themselves. Now, sometimes they think that's foolish. Peter talks about, well, they scoff at you that you don't continue in riot and drunkenness with them. But see, secretly they know, well, down deep, uh-oh, there's something different. <laughs> They're walking by a different life. So that is a witness. But that's not what, and that is a witness, and it's important. It's really important. But see, Jesus said, it's not the candle. Oh, boy, this is good now. I ought to take up an offering right here. <laughs> the candle is a witness. He said, raise it up for the whole world to see. But see, in, in, when he was uh, giving them their instructions, he said, now don't leave Jerusalem. Don't try and be my witness. Not until you've been endued with power. You shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Then you shall be my witnesses. Well, what is witness to what? We weren't there. No, we weren't there when Jesus was raised from the dead. But we have that same testimony. Jesus is raised from the dead. And let me prove it to you. He still heals the sick. And as your hand is going, no, no, <laughs> in, in the name. See, it's the baptism of the Holy Spirit that brings the power. So let's get back. So the, this candle, I saw this candle. And then I saw, at first I called it the flaming tornado. I didn't know what else to call it, you know. Uh, after the service, somebody told me that with all of the fires they have out in California, have you ever seen them on the news? They'll show one of those, and they call them fire nados. And it's really caused by the intense heat going up, but it's flame. But what I saw, that's, those are skinny. No. What I saw was an F5 <laughs> wedge <laughs> power fire tornado. And I saw them side by side at first on the treadmill, Planet Fitness, minding my own business, praying in tongues. And God's teaching me. He, ha he has the most unusual times to come teach you, you know. <laughs> and I saw this candle, and that's good. The candle is a light to the world, and it should be. We're supposed to lift that candle up and let the world see us. I mean, we're getting to, I'm preaching out of Ephesians 5. You just don't know it yet. <laughs> see, it, it, that's a witness, see? But that's not the witness. Because there's that candle, I saw it, and then right next to it, I saw this fire tornado. And later, after I had time to think about it, I went, that reminds me of the pillar of fire by night. And that's more what it was like. The, you know, the cloud by day, and the pillar of fire by night. That thing, you ever, be, you ever really been near a tornado? There's one thing to see them on TV. You ever see the Grand Canyon on TV? I've seen the Grand Canyon, pictures of it, postcards of it my whole life. And then one day I stood at the edge of it. There, nothing prepares you. There is no substitute <laughs> for walking up to the edge of the Grand Canyon. You are changed forever. You'll never be the same. And it, you get right near a real tornado. That they are scary as all get out, church. <laughs> okay. And then what if it was flaming? And it's right next to you. And I saw the candle, and I saw this massive. I mean, nothing can. An F five tornado? Are you kidding? Nothing can withstand that. And what if it was on fire? Then all of a sudden, the candle was inside. The pillar of fire. The two had become one. Now what's amazing, I could still see the candle in there. It did not consume the candle. But the candle and the tornado had become one. It's like that candle was baptismoed. It was immersed. 
fully. We've had, we, I'll speak for myself, but maybe not you. I think what he's doing, so we've had, we've had a hard enough time believing we're the light. We fight with our flesh and the devil, every little loss, every little stumble, the devil magnifies it a thousand times. You're a slime, you're a worm, you're no good. We've struggled to even believe we're the candle. Now he's trying to get us to understand we're a tornado. We're a pillar of fire. We are, we are on fire with the Holy Ghost. We're a miracle going somewhere to happen. We have become one with him. Now, on my phone, the reason I'm doing this, uh, Nathan found a, a GIF, I think it's called. And I'm going to walk towards the tornado. Then I'm gonna, as I'm walking, I'm going to let you guys see this. It's a, it's a flaming, walking man. Can you see it? Yeah. How about on this side? Can you see that? I'm going to walk up here where the camera can see it really good. And hopefully I'm still enough. Is that good? Close enough? All right. This is the image God's trying to burn into us. When you walk, you're not a candle. You're on fire. You have been baptized by Jesus Christ in liquid fire. As I meditated on this image, it was like, if you really watch it for a while, there's a little, whatever, you know, that's a stunt man, I'm sure. Whatever they doused him in, you watch it closely and you'll see drops of flame falling from his hands as he walks. If they'd go down to his feet, I bet you'd see fiery footprints. The Lord's been dealing with me about leaving fiery tracks. When the Lord would come through as the flaming tornado, as the pillar of fire, a man baptized in the Holy Ghost, when he came through that village, when he left on the other side, he left fiery tracks behind him. Sickness had been burned out. Devils had gone. All manner of sickness, all manner of diseases, and healing all that are oppressed of the devil were to leave fiery tracks. Isn't that good? And the thing of it is, we have, if we have already received this power. Somebody was, well, not just somebody, myself. Sometimes I think, did I really get baptized in the Holy Ghost? You know? Well, listen, I can take it further than that. Sometimes I wonder, did I really get saved? Well, I didn't get near as many amens, although I know most of you have had that thought. Okay? <clears throat> All right. How do you know you got saved? Do you, do you go by your feelings? Do you go by your emotions? Do you go by your track record? <laughs> okay, that's enough preaching right there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> How do you... I'm going to give you a hint. How do you know you are saved? By the word of the living God. We have been born again by this living word, the imperishable seed, the word of God. That's how I know. That's how I know, see. The same way that I know that I've been saved is the same way I know I've been baptized in the Holy Ghost. There is not two baptisms. It's just like getting saved. You know, how, you know how Dave would teach us, wouldn't you like to believe that Paul got a little bit more at his new birth than you got at your new birth? We like to say, well, he did so much more than me because he must have got something bigger. Well, the truth of it is, you didn't just get what Paul received. You got the same spirit that Jesus received when God raised him from the dead. And it's the same thing with the baptism in the Holy Ghost. There was 120 people in that upper room. Not just apostles, not just prophets, not just evangelists, not just fivefold. Jesus' own mother was up there. And it says they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And spoke with other tongues. Glory to God. There was fire mentioned there. You know, we see that little picture, like a little flame, a little flame. Have y'all ever seen that painting somebody did? And I know they're doing their best, but it shows them all praying there. And like they each one had a little like a candle flame on top of their head. 
I don't think it was like that at all. <laughs> Candles don't normally come with a rushing mighty wind. But a tornado does. And I believe that pillar of fire did. I don't believe it was silent. I think that thing had a roar to it. We need to have a roar with us when we come into any situation. Did you find Ephesians 5 yet? Did I say go to Ephesians 5? Well, that's my fault. I'm sorry. Go to Ephesians 5. Glory to God. You getting anything out of this? Now, I'm going to, while you're going there, let me remind you of one other verse from this morning. Luke 3, 16. John said to them, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So let's just think about that analogy, all right? John is drawing an analogy between his baptism and the baptism of fire that's coming with Jesus. Well, if you get baptized by John, you're at a nice, cool river. It's the Jordan. The waters are pleasant. It's gently flowing. It's not like you're getting, you know, baptized in white water rapids. <laughs> gently. I mean, it's a pleasant thing, right? John lets you down, brings you up. And if your heart is right, you know, you're, you're bapt baptized into Christ. He called it baptized under repentance. I baptize you with water. But there's another coming. He's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. So now you come to Jesus to be baptized by him, but you're not at the River Jordan. He's going to baptize you in a different river. It's not cool waters. It's a river of liquid fire. <laughs> the purpose. What do, you, what do you think your flesh would think? You come up to this liquid fire. Uh, can we talk about this? <laughs> what? Because the purpose of that fire is to burn up everything in you that's not like Jesus. And the flesh goes, uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> There's a lot in me not like Jesus. I'm not sure we want this baptism. But if you want it, and you ask for it, see, this is what I mean. You didn't get... How did somebody say it today? You didn't get sprinkled out of the lake of fire. It didn't say someone is coming after me to sprinkle you. <laughs> the word is baptismo. And it meant immersion. That's why I know when you got laid down, if you'll allow me, when you got laid down in that lake of fire, none of your parts got missed. See, that word baptismo is a very common word at that time. The, uh, the textile industry would take new cloth, usually white, and they would dye it different colors. And how do you dye it? Well, you take that cloth and you maybe put it on a pole or something. And let, let's take Lydia. She was a, she, uh, she was a, a merchant of purple. So they would dye the clothes purple. So you take this cloth... You put it on a stick or something, whatever they had to hold it. And you didn't sprinkle the dye on it. What did you do? You baptismoed it. You immersed it. I mean, every part of the cloth went into the dye. Now get this. Get this picture. When the cloth comes up, there is no part of the cloth where the dye is not. When you got baptized in the Holy Ghost, there is no part of you where the Holy Ghost is not. Now, see, we've had this concept of Christ in our spirit, Christ in our belly, and that's true. John G. Lake, though, in his writings, and how many of you know he got a little success? <laughs> 100,000 healings in five years at one city and 100,000 in five years at another city not counting all the ones in South Africa. He says, God in heaven is not what the world needs today. God in the church is not what the world needs today. What the world needs today is God in the human body. See, when it says we've been 
filled with the Holy Ghost. You could just as easily say, filled with God. And that means all the way to your fingertips and beyond. That's why when you lay hands on the sick, it's, if Christ has you, it's really his hand. You're his body still anointed by that same Holy Ghost. The purple is on your fingertips. Can I, <laughs> you're going to leave fire tracks behind you. <clears throat> now have you found Ephesians 5, okay? <laughs> And the verse where we normally start is down here in verse 18. Be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And you see that capital S? It's correct here. He's talking about being filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, when Dave would teach us on this verse, he said, well, what happens when you get filled with wine? Doesn't it affect your senses? And he would, he would start talking about, now, in that day, Wally Cox, Barney Fife. For today's audience, I have to say Napoleon Dynamite. 99-pound <laughs> weakling. And you're at the bar. Arnold Schwarzenegger is sitting at the other end of the bar. When you walk in, you wouldn't dare challenge Arnold, would you? After about so many drinks. <laughs> Give me another wine. And you get filled with wine. Doesn't it have an effect on what you think is possible and not possible? Doesn't it? And you start going, who is that wimpy guy at the end of the bar? I think his name is Arnie. <laughs> and before long, the wine has had such an effect on your senses. You're starting to think things are possible that are just not possible. But see, being filled with the Holy Spirit is the exact opposite of that. If you'll allow me, we are drunk on natural wine already. We are duped into believing that what we see is all there is. God wants us to be filled. Give me another drink of that Holy Ghost. I need to be filled. Give me another drink of that. We're going to talk about how in a minute. Give me another drink of that Holy Ghost. And what's happening there, he is taking your senses. And it's having an effect on your senses exactly opposite to that wine. Because what the Holy Ghost does, he's taking you from this drunken stupor that we're, all that we're all in thinking, this is possible and no more. Give me another drink of that. Give me another drink of that Holy Ghost. Pretty soon you're looking at cancer at the end of the bar. I'm going, who are you? Who do you think... I'm a man on fire. I have the name of Jesus. Who do you, who do you, but this time it's for real. Because the Holy Ghost, he uses his power, which is unlimited. He's trying to get you to believe it. And you get filled with the Holy Ghost. It is it affecting your, give me another drink. Give me another drink of that Holy Ghost wine. Pretty soon, cancer is nothing. If you needed it, walking on water is nothing. He's trying to get you to believe the truth from the realm where you're really from. You've got to remember, this natural world was created by that world, the world of the spirit. The, the laws of physics from that realm supersede the laws of physics from this realm. And if we can believe it, we are the agent of authority here that if we can ever learn to co-labor with that supernatural Holy Spirit we've been baptized with, Arnie of cancer at the end of the bar is nothing. We can take him out every time. Amen. Little devils that cause paranoia, schizophrenia, bipolar, they're nothing. Amen. All, my Bible says, all things are possible to him who believes. Well, the Holy Spirit is our teacher. The same one that has the power is the one that's been sent to us to teach us how to walk in that power. You get that? Wherefore he saith, awake, no, further down, 18, be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. He's drawing a direct contrast. Don't let your senses be affected by natural wine. It'll make you stupid. 
Let your senses be affected by taking another drink of the Holy Ghost. Because he'll bring truth to you. And his truth is higher than facts. Truth changes facts. Now, like Ronald Reagan said, facts are stubborn things. But still, facts change. Truth does not. Amen? All right. Now here he says, he said, well, how would I do that, Brother Gary? Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. One way to start, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Now, I, I, see, I can't ever read that without thinking of Paul and Silas in that Philippian jail. Here it is, at, I love how it's phrased, at midnight. Symbolically, your darkest hour. Anyone ever have a dark hour? Well, I've had some dark hours. Most Christians at their darkest hour, to be honest with you, they call for counseling, they, they, they whine and complain, and they want to talk to everybody about how bad it is, and, and even, anyway. But the key is not that. Paul and Silas, all they did was obey God, go to that place, cast a devil out of a fortune-telling girl, and get Lydia and her household saved. That's their big crime. Now they've been beaten, put in the stocks, and at midnight, now they're suffering for righteousness. They didn't do anything wrong. Don't tell me most Christians don't whine and complain right there. But they did not. At midnight, they lifted their voices. They began to sing and pray and sing hymns, and they didn't do it quietly. They said everyone in the prison heard them doing it. I worship you, Lord. I glorify you. I praise you. I thank you. You're my deliverer, my rock, my fortress, my high tower. I don't know what all exactly they did, but it was along that line. And as they did that, it so pleased God. See, it's one thing to shake under the anointing when you're in a line. It's another thing for the prison to shake. <laughs> the building to shake. To the point, it, it shook all the doors open. And most people would have skedaddled right at that moment. Paul didn't leave. His mission wasn't over. I haven't taught this in a little while, just in case you haven't heard it. Why did I, For years, I could not understand why he didn't leave. Paul, Peter left, didn't he? When the angel came and got Peter out of prison, didn't he leave? Do you reckon Paul heard that story? Sure he did. Ah, oh, prison doors are open. We're out of here. It, was, it took a long time for the Holy Ghost to get it across to me. Paul says, we can't go yet. Well, why can't we go? Y'all remember why they were there in the first place? Paul had a vision. And it showed in that vision, it says he saw a man, a man of Macedonia saying, come over into Macedonia and help us. Paul's in that prison and says, well, we, we cast the devil out of that girl and we got Lydia's household saved, but I haven't yet seen that man. And it says the jailer, the, the, the head guy of the jail, he was going to kill himself because he knew he'd be executed anyway. He was going to kill himself. Paul shouts out, do thyself no harm. We're all here. We're all here. Now, I saw this in a vision. For me, it's a movie. I don't know if it'll have the impact on you. They didn't have flashlights, did they? But it's dark. What did he have? He had some kind of a torch. Had it somewhere close to his face. It's dark in there. Now, can you see Paul? In this darkness, he sees a light coming down the hallway. Do, do yourself no harm. We're all here. So here comes the jailer to see. And first there's a light coming down the hall, getting lighter and lighter. And all of a sudden, that guy comes into the cell. And here's the torch right by his face. Oh, I can almost see Paul nudging Silas if he could. That's the man. <laughs> That's the man in the vision that I saw. And the jailer, he drops to his knees. What must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. Glory to God. Oh, I love the Word of God. Isn't that something? Even when the prison doors are shook, Paul, Paul was so, see, this is one of the keys of being baptized in that Holy Ghost power. Being sold out to Jesus. If they put me in the prison, I'm yours. If the prison doors are opened, I'm yours. If 
you want me to leave, I'm leaving. If you want me to stay, I'm staying. But I'm here to do your will, Lord. And I'm not leaving until I see the man you sent me here to witness to. See, no wonder that same church later on, Paul wrote to that, wrote, <laughs> Paul wrote to that same church later on. I'll leave it, it's good. Paul wrote to that same church later on, and, and he said, no other church but you, Philippi, Philippians, no other church but you in the beginning of the gospel. No other church communicated with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. They were the only church. That tells you one thing right there, because Paul had been preaching in a lot of churches. One thing you know he wasn't preaching Give to my ministry, and God will make you rich. He wasn't preaching that, was he? They'd have been given, wouldn't they? No other church would give but the Philippians. You know why? Don't you know the word of that spread through that town? He said, I don't know about these other preachers, but I can tell you one thing about Paul. He is not after our money. He won't even leave the prison till he witnesses to the man God sent him there to get. When we send this man money, we can trust. It's going to be used for the kingdom of God. God, is that good stuff or what? Let's get back to the baptism in the Holy Ghost. Speaking to yourself, verse 19, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord. See, that reads so easy in church when we're in a nice air-conditioned building and everything's nice and nobody's whacking you over the head or giving you any trouble. But when the bills are due and the kids are rebellious and your car's got a flat tire and the washing machine quit and the cat bit you on the leg. and No, it'd be a dog. I'm sorry. A dog bit you on the leg. And me and Me and Alan. And your emotions are bad. You feel like having a pity party. And, and trust me, I've been there. It's one thing to read it here in church. It's another thing at your darkest hour. And you didn't really do anything wrong. And all hell has come against you. Circumstances are bad. I, but I want to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Singing. Making melody in your heart to the Lord. Hmm? That's a whole different attitude from the world, isn't it? Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now let me show you the candle though. See, we normally just read that and take it as a separate lesson. And it's okay to do that. Teach it about how you get filled with the Holy Ghost. Well, this is one, this is part of it. Uh, stir up the gift that is in you. I read that this morning from 1 Timothy, or is it 2 Timothy? I've got it on the page. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6. Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God. Let me read that to you in the Amplified. So hang on just a moment. Yes. That I... <clears throat> Somebody told me about this after the service. It's so fit the pattern. Now, remember the, the, the man walking with fire? Remember the fire tracks? Baptized in liquid fire? Here's, listen to this. 2 Timothy 1.6. This is why I would remind you to stir up, parentheses, get this, rekindle the embers and fan the flame of fire. And keep it burning. God. Holy Jesus. <laughs> Is that not perfect with the analogy from this morning? Yeah. Stir it. See, we get the idea of stirring the pot. No, stir the embers. Stir up those embers. Some, I got to tell you, now I'm talking from experience now. Sometimes the war gets long. The circumstances, they go on for a long time and you feel weak and tired. It's not that you don't love God. It's not that you're not on your way to heaven. But you're just tired. It's, and if you'll allow me, it's like the fire burns dimly. And I love this analogy. I don't care. Take the poker. Lily likes to poke, my, poke the fire, by the way. 
Every time I'm walking over there to, we got a fire. I love a fireplace. We got a fire going at our house. Every time she sees me go get the poker, she said, Papa, let me poke it. <laughs> she likes to poke that fire. But see, it can get burnt down. It, you know, almost, I wonder if it's still, you take that poker over there and you start stirring it. There is still fire there. There's still fire in you. Sometimes you've got to take that poker. Smith, that's Smith Wigglesworth said, if the spirit doesn't move, I move the spirit. That almost sounds like blasphemy. But he's the guy that walked in the flames. He's the guy that walked in it. I'll take his counsel. Amen. Now let me show you the difference between the, the candle and the tornado. Did you know it's in Ephesians 5? This is what I mean. We should take up an offering right here. Back up to verse 1 of chapter 5. Because he, does, he talks about the candle first before he starts talking about the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Be you therefore followers of God as dear children. Now notice, walk in love. What is the first fruit of the Spirit? Love. Remember from Galatians 5, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, so forth. Walk in love as, as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us as an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. Now watch this. This is all candle stuff here. Everything he's talking about here is candle stuff, not Holy Ghost stuff. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become a saints. He's talking about the candle. He's saying let that candle shine. Let the world see a difference between Christians and non-Christians. He's still talking about candle stuff in verse 4. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. And I'm just going to tell you in plain English today, if they was writing it today, they say, stop telling dirty jokes. You don't have any cause as a Christian to be telling dirty jokes. Stop it. Verse 5. For this you know, I wish the church today did know it, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, uh oh, nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any. As if you look this up in the Greek, it's even worse than it is in English. I mean, stronger. It means not one square inch. You have no inheritance in the kingdom of God. And then the preaching was already going on then in the first century because otherwise Paul wouldn't need to warn them. It was already going on, people saying God's grace covers all those things. You can, be, you can do those things and make heaven. It, they, were, they were teaching it already in the first century. Let no man deceive you with vain words. For because of these things, now this is still candle stuff. We're not even talking about the baptism in the Holy Ghost. Because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not you, therefore, partakers with them. Why write those words to Christians if it's not possible that you could become a partaker of that wrath with them? Verse 8. For you were sometimes, and that just means previously, you were previously darkness. But now are you light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Now this is all candle stuff. Do you notice the candle stuff comes before the fire stuff? <laughs> you, we, we don't get to the baptism in the Holy Ghost, if you'll allow me, till verse 18. Okay? But he's talking about, listen, you need to walk in the light as he is in the light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. Still talking about candle stuff. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved, and that means exposed, are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore he saith, and I'm telling you there's a tons of Christians, you notice he said up there, you are light, 
Now, walk as children of light. I'm telling you, there are tons and tons of Christians today in this modern world that has believed such a watered-down gospel. I'm not saying they're not light, but they better change their walk. They better change it. And God gives space for repentance. So I didn't prepare it, but if you go to Revelations where he's talking to the seven churches, and he comes to that one where Jezebel was, and even Jezebel and her followers, he says, I gave them space to repent. Now, and it was bad. What Jezebel there was teaching, it's, it's as dirty and filthy as it gets. And even then, Jesus says, I gave them space to repent. Listen, Christian. Listen to me. You are light. Walk as a child of light. If you are habitually in the things named in this chapter, you are in danger of becoming a partaker with the children of darkness. For nothing. Gratification of the flesh. For what? When all of your eternity is at stake. We're in the fasting season. Do some. Pray in the Holy Ghost. I like how Angie said it. Fasting without prayer is just dieting. Fasting with prayer. Spend some time with God. Repent. Get out of that. Don't live in chronic fornication or any of these things he listed here. Anyway. All of, notice it's candle, 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 candle. Then he said, so in verse 14, Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, arise from the dead. Christ shall give thee light. See then, now he's talking about your walk. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools. In plain English, if you're a child of light, and let's just pick one. You're living in chronic fornication. Chronic. Habitual fornication. You're a fool. Paul wrote it. I did not write this. You're, he says, you're a fool. You're walking in danger of eternal hell fire. And God's given you space to repent. Thank God if you say, well, I feel real sorry about it. Well, thank God. You know what that means? You've not yet come to that place of a reprobate mind. You stay, if, if you feel guilty about it, well, good. That's not good enough. Feel guilty enough to do whatever it takes. Change your friends, change your job, change whatever. You've got to change your life. You cannot live like that and make heaven. Second Peter, I don't have time to really get into that. I'm, gosh, I'm out of time. Second Peter, he, he warns. He said, listen, and it's a warning to Christians who were flirting with sin. He said, look, God didn't spare the angels. They were created holy and righteous. God didn't spare them. He says, Sodom and Gomorrah, the way they were living, God did not spare them. He said, in the days of Noah, millions upon millions of people on planet Earth, most of them religious of one kind or another, God did not spare them either. And the message is, if God didn't spare the angels, if he didn't spare the people in Noah's day, if he didn't spare Sodom and Gomorrah, he is not going to spare you either. Don't be a fool. Don't be a fool. I'm preaching to me too. Gear, are you in fornication? No, I'm not. What are you in? None you? <laughs> I don't know any perfect people. And that now we're going right back to Alan's message because I agree with it 100%. It's not really Alan's message, but the one he did recently. Walk in the light as he is in the light. God's not requiring perfection, but he's sure requiring your heart. He wants your best efforts. He wants you pressing towards the mark and, and walking with him. And the Holy Ghost, he will help you with your infirmities. Now, your flesh is going to hate this whole process. Tough. Tough. Sue's message. Flesh, you are not the boss of me. <laughs> Mary likes that. You are not the boss of me. Well, your flesh won't take that line down. Have you found that out? It goes, yes, I am too. Try, you don't believe it? Try fasting. You'll find out. I'll slap that flesh. goes, I'll slap you six ways from you'll want four cheeseburgers <laughs> before I'm done with you. 
And you'll find out. It's fasting season. We are the light. Walk as children of the light. Mm. Boy, it's quite a message tonight. I really wasn't expecting to be this serious. The candle is a good witness. The world does take notice. But the candle, where he's taking us now, and we've already got it. See? You've got to know you have it. Your candle really has been immersed in that pillar of fire. You've got to start seeing yourself as some little weak, blown in the wind little candle. You've got to, we've got to start seeing ourselves as that tornado of fire. When you, like that man walking. I like that vision again. I'm going to finish with it. I think I can still bring it up again. This is the vision. When you walk, when you walk in the room or anywhere you go. Hang on here. I know I've still got it. This is who you are. You have been baptized in that lake of fire. This is who you are. You're not some little candle in danger of having your light blown out. Just, just a little candle. I'll, I'll come back to the camera in a minute. You're not some little candle blown by the wind. You have been baptized in the river of liquid fire. And there should be fire tracks where you walk. Did you get anything out of that? <laughs> Glory to God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. All right, well, we're going to go ahead and start the confessions now. Angie, that is whatever I taught this morning, part two. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> she just sent me the title, and that's what it was. So. Praise the Lord. All right, well, we're going to go ahead and start the confessions now. Did you notice how it said speaking to yourselves? We didn't really teach tonight, but, what, you know, every time that you do confession, do you know you're, you're your own best preacher? You're preaching to yourself what God has said. Abraham preached to himself for years uh, because God changed his name. Anyway, don't get started on that. We'll be here another few hours. <laughs> to say with me, Father, I worship you. I glorify you. I praise you. You're not a man that you could lie. You have exalted your word above your name. Heaven and earth will pass away. But your word will never pass away. Therefore I say. Your glory is present at the prayer center. The blind see. The deaf hear. The lame walk. The dead are raised. And the poor. They have the gospel preached to them. A minimum of a thousand people are born again at the prayer center every week. We have a minimum of 500 intercessors who are holding up the message that has come to maturity. We are able to get along with each other while the Father works revival in our midst. We have that kind of worship that takes us beyond the veil of the flesh in order that we may worship in spirit and in truth. We worship you, Father, out of our new nature. We give you family worship as your sons and daughters. Father, at the prayer center, those that come will see a people transformed to the nature of Christ. Father, we say, in the name of Jesus, no person ever leaves the prayer center the same way they came. Every person that comes receives a touch from the Good Shepherd. Father, those that come who are beaten down, Discouraged, worn out, and tired. They won't leave that way. They'll be encouraged, strong, and mature. They'll leave standing upright. 
their shoulders squared, their heads held high, going forth as a mighty army to take this planet for your kingdom. In the name of Jesus. Father, your glory fills every service. Every person that comes drinks of your glory. They'll leave as earthen vessels filled with your glory, filled with your wisdom, filled with your love, filled with your grace, and anointed by your Spirit. They'll carry your presence with them. They'll carry revival around this world. Father, we declare, we preach your gospel. We'll never settle for man's gospel. Only yours. It's the gospel that saves, the gospel that fills, and the gospel that heals. That's why we say, lost, be saved. Empty, be filled. Blind, see. Lame, walk. Deaf, hear. Maimed, be whole. Dead, rise again. In the name of Jesus. Father, that's your gospel. We'll settle for nothing less. We're going for the gold. We have what we say. And we say at every service, the lost are saved. People are filled with the Holy Ghost. The blind see. The lame walk. The deaf hear. The maimed are made whole. And even the dead are raised. In the name of Jesus. More than 12 legions of angels are loosed to prepare the way for revival. Angels are dispatched to the four corners of the earth, intercepting and stopping every mission and every assignment of the enemy that would bring circumstances against those who would come. Angels are changing those circumstances by rearranging them, causing money to come. And by changing schedules, we say every person that is to be here will be here in the name of Jesus. There is no devil big enough, no assignment crafty enough, no circumstances bad enough <clears throat> that will keep even one from being here. Father, we declare your house full. Angels are moving back. The forces of darkness over this region. <clears throat> They're opening up a window. Window of light. 25 miles in every direction. Both horizontally and vertically. There is a fortress of angels. Surrounding us to keep back the darkness. Father, angels are dispatched now. Softening the hearts where hurts have wounded, where calluses have formed, where walls of defenses have gone up. Angels are softening the hearts and creating atmospheres where the people can hear the voice of their shepherd. Angels are preparing their hearts now. So they're already receivers when they arrive. From the first word spoken, from the first song sung, from the first prayer prayed, to the end of every service, the people are free to receive from your spirit. The assignments of all devils against the prayer center, the people of the prayer center, and the leadership of the prayer center, including Pastor Dave, all those assignments are dismissed 
in the name of Jesus. I declare those plans null and void. Devil, we're taking Tulsa from you. In fact, we already have. Jesus is Lord over Tulsa. Not you. We're an authority here. Not you. Devil, get out of Tulsa. Take all your demons with you. <clears throat> the King of Kings has made a decree. And I am speaking in his stead. The King has declared. This is the acceptable year of the Lord. The King has decreed. Captives, you are free. Every person returns to his original inheritance. That is the born again trail. Father, you have restored our inheritance. At the prayer center, the inheritance is not just known about. We don't just teach about it, but it's received, manifested, and seen. Father, you have restored our fellowship with you. The firstborn told us to pray. Father, your will be done on earth, just as it is in heaven. As in heaven, so on earth. As in heaven, so in Tulsa. There are no lost people in heaven. Therefore, we say, Tulsa is saved. There are no sick people in heaven. Therefore, we say, Tulsa is healed. There are no demoniacs in heaven. Therefore, we say, Tulsa is delivered. And there's no poor people in heaven. Therefore, we say, Tulsa is prospered. And Tulsa is blessed. We declare every captive free. Every wheelchair emptied. All of them, no exceptions. Every artificial help. Wheelchairs, crutches, canes, hearing aids, glasses, stretchers, bladder bottles. They may need them when they come. They won't need them when they leave. And we'll have them here as trophies. To the glory of Jesus the healer. All manner of sickness and all manner of diseases are healed first time, every time, all of them, no exceptions. Jesus, you healed them all then. You healed them all now. That's what we say. That's what we have in the name of Jesus. I've been baptized in liquid fire. Baptized in liquid fire. Jesus, is Jesus is my baptizer. I've been baptized in the Holy Ghost. Baptized in the Holy Ghost. I've, been in the I've been saturated in the Holy Ghost. Every part of me that is, part of me is, that is, is the Holy Ghost, Ghost. mingled together with me. Mingle together with me. I and the Holy Ghost together. Go about doing good in the name of Jesus, healing all that are oppressed of the devil. I leave fire tracks behind me in the name of Jesus. Whew. Oh, I like that. I like that. I'm not changing the confessions, but I like that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, there are impartations of your spirit. We declare these are the most powerful, the most anointed, the most life-changing, the most revival-producing services in history. Fresh anointings, fresh giftings like never before since the book of Acts. Father, it's you doing the works. Therefore, all things are possible. Soul, 
my own soul. I command you, believe this, all things are possible. All things are possible. All things are possible. And every backslider will come back to God. They will never leave God again. So now, Father, in preparation, I forgive every person their trespasses against me. Father, forgive me all of my trespasses against you. I am freshly washed in the blood of the Lamb in order that my record in heaven be perfect. Therefore, I say, because of the blood, what Jesus did for me, according to my record in heaven, I have never failed God. I lay down my life that the life of Christ may be manifest in me. I take no offense. I give no offense. And according to my record in heaven, I never have. At the prayer center, the mind of Christ is delivered to both the sheep and the shepherds. It is delivered with such simplicity and with such clarity that the wayfaring fool could not misunderstand it. Therefore, I say, the people at the prayer center, and especially me, we all understand every word that Pastor Dave teaches. And we declare that Pastor Dave teaches. Every need is met, no matter how large, no matter how small. There are no cases too hard. There are no cases too late. Whatever they come for to receive from Jesus, they get it. All of them. First time. Every time. No exceptions. I declare every captive free. Free in spirit. Free in soul. Free in body. All are delivered. And all are restored. Father, you are provider. Angels are dispatched. To gather in all of the finances. And everything that is required. <clears throat> things we know about now. Things we don't even know about yet. Because you are the God who answers before we call. I speak against the strongholds of lack. And I declare an abundance. Abundance. Be in the name of Jesus. This morning, this doesn't have to be on the main service. This verse just keeps coming. You remember the big challenge? What was the big challenge in the wilderness? Because God had declared to Jesus, this is my son. So God bore witness, this is my son. Romans 8, 16 says, The Holy Spirit, which is God, bears witness with our spirit. That we are the children of God. See, so Gary, who do you think you're talking to? You're talking, who do you think I am? Child of God? And the answer is, yes. See, the same declaration, the same witness. You are my child. Be filled with the Holy Ghost. Now you become the same th and have the name of Jesus. Now you become the same threat to the kingdom of darkness that Jesus was. No wonder all hell comes at you. But the truth of the matter is all heaven's coming against hell with you. We're about to go on the offensive. I'm tired of being on the defensive. Isn't that right? I'm, t I'm tired of fighting off cancer from us. Let's go get it off other folks. Amen? Amen. All right. Sorry, that's... 
you got to understand, that's another message, but that same witness, you are my child, has been declared by God over you. The Holy Spirit bears witness, you are my child. You are my child. Hmm. You are my child. Glory to God. Feet, stay here. Come on. I have no idea. Therefore, we say, <clears throat> there is no lack. We operate. See, I'm trying to do this, and there's preaching on the inside. Can you tell? <laughs> we operate from abundance. We operate from surplus. <laughs> we have all in a bound with many baskets left over. We have such abundance. We can pay the way for many to come and many to go. We send them out on prosperous journeys for God with abundance in a manner fitting for servants of the Lord. Our financial granaries are full because our king has found stewards he can trust. And I'm one of them. Father, if you need anything, come to my house first. Don't go to Fred's house first. Come to my house first. <laughs> All I need to know is my Lord has need of it. And it's yours. I've been bought with a price. My life is not my own. I am a first class servant. Lord, I lay all my possessions at your feet. And I say again, Lord, if you need anything I have, it's yours. I love you, Lord, with all of my heart, all of my soul, all of my mind, and all of my strength. The second commandment is like unto the first. I love my neighbor as myself. I love my good neighbors. I love my bad neighbors. I love my mean neighbors. And I love my enemies. Jesus, you are my Savior. You are my Lord. Whatever you ask, that's what I do. I am your servant. I am your bond slave by my own free will choice. And I serve you, Lord, by serving these people that you love so much. I serve the good people. I serve the bad people. I serve the mean people. And I especially serve your enemies. Because you're trying to save them all. You'd like to use me to do it. All that I have is yours. My time is yours. My body is yours. My family is yours. I own nothing. I am your bond slave. Use me as you will. You are provider for me, my family, and all that I have. And I am available for your use. We lift up the blood-stained banner over this city. Written in the blood of Jesus on the banner are these words. Jesus is Lord over Tulsa. Jesus is Lord over Tulsa. Tulsa is in revival. Tulsa is in revival. And where Jesus is Lord, the Father's will is done. Father, have your way. Not just 30-fold, not just 60-fold, but 100-fold. Again, I say, lost, be saved. Empty, be filled. Captives, go free. Blind, see. Deaf, hear. Lame, walk. Maimed, be whole. Dead, rise again. In the name of Jesus. 
Father, thine is the kingdom. Thine is the power. Thine is the glory. Forever your will be done in Tulsa. Just as it is in heaven. As in heaven, so in earth. As in heaven, so in Tulsa. Tulsa is saved. Tulsa is saved. Tulsa is saved. Now shout about it. Hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory. Tulsa is in revival. We have what we say in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Tulsa is in revival. Glory to God and revived. Hallelujah. <laughs> I'd right, extend your faith and maybe your hand this way. You don't have to repeat after me, of course. Father, we've already prayed for every one of these cases represented by these pictures. And each one of them, Lord, the world, even with modern medical science, which is probably really stupid to you, <laughs> but even with the best we have, they have no answers at all for these cases. And Father, there's no such thing as impossible with you. Jesus taught us our job is to pray and believe that we receive when we pray. That's why we're not praying again, Lord. We know you heard us the first time. Father, our job is to believe that you heard us and answered that prayer. And then you said, we shall see it in the land of the living. Father, we thank you. We shall see the miracle, the manifestation of your supernatural power for every one of these cases in Jesus' name. Father, regarding prayer requests inside this box, which changes daily, Father, there's probably everything in here from simple things to really hard from our point of view. None of it's hard for you. Father, everything from hangnails to suicide and everything in between. Father, I, f I know there's parents sending the names of their children here. I know there's children sending names of parents. Father, and there's everything in the world, but your word tells us that if we ask anything that is according to your will, we know that you hear us. And our confidence is, if you hear us, then we have the petition that we desire of you. So, Father, we're thanking you right now. We're glorifying you, Lord. Thank you for answering every single prayer that Jesus paid the price for them to have. And, Father, if a, if a stranger sent a prayer request here, someone who's not yet born again, and it doesn't matter to us if they're agnostic, atheist, Buddhist, Muslim, Hindu, or anything else. Father, if somehow they had enough faith to send a prayer request here, and that request is in line with your will, Father, we ask like Solomon asked, answer the prayer of the stranger. Father, do it in such a unique and unusual way that they'll have to know it was you that answered that prayer. So they can know, like we already know, that you're the only true and living God. And they can hear the gospel of your son and be saved. Father, we pray for every prayer cloth that goes forward from this place. It began with the fringe on Jesus' garment. That woman with the issue of blood touched it and was healed. And the word spread and everybody else who touched it, they got healed. Then in the book of Acts, Lord, when they took those cloths and aprons from Paul's body, they're laid on the sick, Lord. They were healed. When they're laid on those that had devils, the devils came out. Father, you're the same God today that you were in the book of Acts. We expect the same thing on every prayer cloth that goes forward from here. When those cloths are laid on the sick, they will recover. When they're laid on people that have devils, those devils will come out. Alcoholics will be delivered. Drug addicts will be delivered. Even all kinds of mental disease will instantly depart, and they'll be set in their right mind. You'll turn the hearts of the children to the parents, put marriages back together. Turn the hearts of the parents to the children, and many other things you do, because you are the same God today that you were in the book of Acts. Father, we do lift up Pastor Dave and Rosalie to you. Personally, Father, I've not given up. I don't think anyone here has given up. Father, I'm looking forward to the day that right in the middle of a message I'm delivering, Pastor Dave walks up to the pulpit and says, 
Gary, you can sit down. I'll take it from here. That'll be a great day. Father, we call Dave Roberson healed. Every bit, spirit, soul, body. Every bit. In fact, I'm calling forth Dave 2.0. Even better than the original. <laughs> but we lift up Dave and Rosalie, their children, grandchildren, all of their house. Lift up Tim and Leah Stemple, all of their house. Father, all of the ministers and their families here and around the world that have joined themselves with this vision, all of the congregations and all of the servants, Lord, all of the staff that help so unselfishly. Father, we declare no weapon formed against any of them will prosper. But everything they set their hand to do will prosper in the name of Jesus. Yes, sir. Father, we lift up our president to you today. And all of the Congress and the Senate, Lord. Father, your word declares that a kingdom divided cannot stand. Unify this nation, Lord. Unify this nation, but unify it in righteousness. Blessed is the land whose God is the Lord. Let righteousness rule and reign in this land once more. Give our leaders wisdom, Lord, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable godly life in Jesus' name. Give them wisdom. Father, last but not least, we're faced with another week. And we have the same hours available to us as any king or any president of any country. Lord, if anything, the hours at our disposal might even be more important than theirs. Because our hours deal with eternal things. Whereas theirs deal more with temporal things. Father, it's so easy for another week to go by and not give you the time that you've asked of us. Lord, help us with our time we want to stand before you someday I know we're going to stand before you one day and give an account of the stewardship of how we stewarded the life you gave us we sure want to have the same testimony as the apostle Paul we fought the good fight we kept the faith and we finished the race you set in front of us father for us we know what that race is and it is revival father you will have your revival in Jesus' name we pray and everybody says, Amen, Amen, Amen. amen.